these wavelengths of infrared light from the stars. And the capabilities of SOFIA have done amazing things. We've studied the magnetic fields of other galaxies. We've studied the, um, we've studied things like Pluto and being occult, occulting background stars or tiny objects further out in the solar system, briefly passing in front of background stars because SOFIA can chase their shadow. It's an amazing observatory. I was very lucky to actually be granted observing time on SOFIA to study the dust around red supergiants. So stars like Betelgeuse that are shedding dust and nearing the ends of their lives. So I got the chance to fly aboard SOFIA when it took off on a Southern Hemisphere campaign, so flying out of Christchurch, New Zealand. On my flight, we actually got to fly down almost over the Antarctic Circle. We flew far enough that we were able to see the Southern Aurora out the window of the plane. It is the coolest thing I have ever gotten to do in my job, and it's got some stiff competition. I got to interview the pilots and the people who work on making SOFIA happen and learn the history of airborne astronomy because we've been sending planes, high, um, telescopes up on board planes for decades. So this is not what people picture when they think of astronomy, but it is one of the cooler stories that I got to tell in the book. I also got to talk to people who go on expeditions for their research. Now, right as I was signing on to this meeting, I was hearing stories about traveling for observations and realizing, oh no, you might've forgotten something or traveling and having to bring all of your equipment with you. I got to talk to eclipse astronomers who carry their professional equipment all over the planet to chase total solar eclipses so that they can study the corona of the sun, the physics of the sun, and use that really unique opportunity to observe the sun with their equipment. So this is a picture from one of my interviewees from a total solar eclipse up in Svalbard in Norway, where as part of their visit, they had to get polar bear safety training. And polar bear safety sounds like a bit of an oxymoron. The training did involve firearms. Fortunately, they never got into any trouble, but they had not expected that, you know, polar bear safety was going to be part of studying the outer edges of the sun. I also got to talk to people that did other types of airborne astronomy. We've sent telescopes aloft on airplanes. We'll also send them up on, bo on board um, scientific balloons and launch um, launch telescopes up into the highest reaches of the atmosphere to float up there for hours and observe data that we cannot normally get from the ground. Some of these launches happen in places like Australia or New Mexico. I also got to hear about launches happening from the South Pole. I talked to people who work at the South Pole Telescope, an amazing place for long wavelength astronomy because the South Pole is a desert and an amazing dark and clear place for astronomical observations. So you can see from all these pictures, the amazingly far flung places that we send telescopes. The winner though, for the most extraordinary adventure that a telescope has ever gone on is actually this picture on the lower right. So that scientist wearing a lab coat and standing next to a little telescope, I'll admit, is George Carruthers. He is the inventor of ultraviolet cameras and ultraviolet telescopes, so the ability to capture UV light. And he put his invention into this telescope that he designed. So it's fairly little, it's about a four inch aperture telescope, but this telescope was flown to the surface of the moon and used as part of Apollo 16 to take some of the first ultraviolet observations we'd ever gotten of the stars. We got ultraviolet observations of our own Earth. It's for sure the most amazing trip and the most amazing adventure that a telescope has gotten to go on so far for astronomy. When I was writing this book, I had to limit the scope of these stories a little bit because I knew I couldn't tell all the stories of the Hubble Space Telescope and the amazing work that amateur astronomers do and all the different facets of our field. So I decided I was going to stick to professional astronomy and I was going to stick to ground-based astronomy. And I stick by including George Carruthers' telescope in the book because that telescope is on the ground. The ground just happens to be the ground of the moon. So it counts as a ground-based telescope and the adventure went into the book. I think the best single adventure I'd heard about sort of something going wrong or something surprising you at an observatory happened amazingly right here in Washington state. And it was a story told about this little observatory, Manastash Ridge Observatory in sort of central, southern central Washington. And the story behind this actually involves a graduate student at the University of Washington at the time named Doug Geisler.
So Doug had traveled out to Manastash Ridge Observatory some years ago, back in 1980, to get the first observations for his PhD thesis. I thought that I had a rough night at Subaru observing for my thesis when there was a mechanical problem with the telescope. Um, Doug's first night of thesis observing does have me beat. Although in his defense, his first night of observing went great. He got great observations of old stars in nearby globular clusters. He was trying to study their chemistry. And in accordance with good astronomy practice, he took careful notes on his night in the telescope's observing log. And he noted, all right, it's May 18th. It's the evening of May 18th. The clouds cleared off. It was beautiful. The sky quality was excellent. Some there were a few clouds that showed up, but they didn't mess with my observations. Everything went wonderfully. And you can see some of the notes he makes. He says, I observed for 10 hours. I didn't lose any hours to any weather or any problems. The sky condition was excellent. Doug had a great night. Doug then went to bed early on the morning of May 18th, 1980. Now, when I tell this story in Washington state, this is about the point where people in the crowd start going, oh, because that date sticks in everybody's mind and they know what's coming. Doug woke up around noon that morning on the day of May 18th, and he was ready to open the door, head out, check out the telescope, and get started on his day. When he opened the door of the dormitory, instead of the blinding midday sun, he opened the door into just blackness. He couldn't see more than a few feet in front of him. He grabbed a flashlight beam, and it got swallowed up by the darkness. There was this awful sort of brimstone smell in the air. He had no idea what he was standing in the middle of. Now, as it turns out, earlier that morning, Mount St. Helens had erupted about 90 miles to the southwest. And the way Mount St. Helens erupted effectively blew off a whole side of the volcano. And what this meant was that that plume of volcanic ash and smoke went flying to the northeast. And you can see from a satellite photo of the eruption exactly what happened, because you'll see Mount Helens erupt, you'll see where Doug was, at the observatory and you'll see what happened. The plume of the volcano blasted right over Manastash Ridge Observatory. Doug didn't know this at first. He didn't have, you know, a cell phone that he could check for news. He thought he was staring at the end of the world. He raced back indoors. He eventually found a radio report that explained what had happened. And then he ran back outside to cover the telescope as quickly as he could, knowing that volcanic ash was corrosive and that he needed to keep any ash from settling onto the mirror or the equipment to avoid damaging it. He then very carefully went back inside and entered his night log entry because he knew how his next night of observing was going to go. Hours lost, six, reason, volcano, sky condition, black and smelly, and carefully detailed what had happened to him and how he took care of covering up the telescope and then carefully driving home. So Doug's log entry is still up there at Manastash Ridge. It's absolutely become a legend in the Washington State astronomy community. And this then lent me the title for chapter four of The Last Stargazers, Hours Lost Six Reason Volcano. So it's a chapter exploring all the different ways that we kind of wind up at odds with the planet itself and the natural world while we're trying to do our observations. So the last question that I asked people was how astronomy had changed since they began observing, how they'd seen their jobs shift. And the first thing that everyone pointed out was the degree to which the technology had changed. Back when some of my interviewees were starting to observe, the way that we still stored astronomical photographs in a way that persisted up into the 80s was using glass photographic plates. So these were plates treated with an emulsion on one side that would darken when they were exposed to light. These plates were incredibly fiddly and difficult to work with, but they took some pretty exquisite little pictures. This is a great photographic plate photo of NGC 6946. It's a favorite galaxy of mine. And you can see the nice clear detail of the spiral arms. You can see what look like little knots of what might be star forming regions. You can see signs of the dust lanes in the galaxy. It's a wonderful photo and people did amazing science with it. But the observers that I talked to who had worked through this shift from photographic plates to digital imaging, talked about how their image quality had gone from this to this. So this is NGC 6946 taken with Subaru, the telescope I was using in the story that I told at the start of the talk. You can see how exquisite the detail is, how great the color combination is, how much more you can pull out of that. And this kind of digital data has really changed 
the technology that we have available to us to do our observations, the scientific questions that we can answer, and it started to change how we do our research. One of the last trips that I took in my research for the last stargazers was down to Rubin Observatory in Chile. So this observatory is named after Vera Rubin, so the woman who discovered dark matter. It's a cooperative um, endeavor that the University of Washington is a leading partner in, and it is getting ready to come online in about the next year or so. And it's going to be an enormous survey telescope. It is going to survey the southern sky over and over again every few days for 10 years. It's effectively going to give us a decade-long movie of the night sky and everything that changes or everything that's different in the sky. If a supernova appears, you'll see that bright spot appear in the movie. If a star is variable, you'll see it blink and dim and blink and dim during the course of that data. You'll see little asteroids scooting across the frame, moving differently to the background stars. So this observatory is going to be an amazing tool for finding anything that changes in the night sky, and anything that we might want to follow up with more questions. It's also going to be an observatory that operates almost alone. There's going to be an operator there, there will be one or two other people there for safety, but the telescope is going to follow its preset pattern and point wherever it's planned to point in the night sky. It's going to be incredible for finding variable stars, it's going to give us this unbelievable volume of targets to study, but it's going to be doing this sort of following a set pattern. And it means that the serendipitous way of observing and some of the things we sort of find by surprise or find by accident won't necessarily be found in this telescope and in this way. And as a comparison to that, I wanna share briefly the science of one of the cool uh, discoveries that I got to make and the really lucky way that we managed to make it. So I mentioned before that I was studying red supergiants with Sophia. So stars like Betelgeuse, very big, massive, cold stars that are nearing the ends of their lives. This was the research that I had started with Felmassi at Kitt Peak back in that very first observing run. And I had been studying red supergiants for several years when I got an email one day from a woman named Anna Zhitkov. And she explained that she used to work with Kip Thorne, that she and Kip Thorne had predicted these very unusual stars called Thorne Zhitkov objects that looked a lot like red supergiants. And she was wondering if I'd ever heard of them or if I was ever interested in studying them. So a Thorne Zhitkov object is a star that from the outside looks like a normal red supergiant. But deep inside, instead of a typical stellar core, instead of a core fusing helium into carbon as a way of producing energy, it has a core that is a neutron star. So these tiny, dense, leftover husks of dead stars that are supported by the principles of quantum physics. Kip Thorne and Anna Zhitkov thought that a star like this could form, could exist, and could stay stable. And from the outside, would look almost exactly like a normal red supergiant. I actually have an animation for how we think Thorne Zhitkov objects most likely form. You start with two pretty massive stars in a binary system, so two stars that we would classify as blue supergiants. And in this system, the more massive blue supergiant will end its life first, it will collapse, and it will then generate this explosive supernova and leave behind a neutron star. Its companion will then puff up and inflate, turning from a blue supergiant into a red supergiant, and swallow that neutron star companion. The companion, we think, will actually spiral into and disrupt the core of the red supergiant and eventually replace it. So you have something that on the screen looks just like a normal red star, but buried in it is this quantum mechanic supported core. Anna thought that in our sample of red supergiants, we might have stars like this, but the only way to find them because they look just like red supergiants is to look for really unusual chemistry in the star's atmosphere. So elements produced near the surface of that white hot neutron star at the core of the star that then got dredged up into the atmosphere. We thought this sounded really cool. And we put in a request to use the Magellan telescopes at Las Campanas Observatory in Chile. So Magellan, until COVID-19 hit and all observatories had to move to remote observations, Magellan worked as a very classical telescope. To use that telescope, you had to fly down to Chile, drive hours out to this beautiful mountaintop, and then sit at the telescope all night. So we went down there for these observations with a plan saying, you know, we're going to try and look at our list of red supergiants. Maybe a few of these are Thorne objects. But as we waited and got ready to observe, we kept tinkering 
with the plant. We would add a star, we would move a star, we would change exactly how we wanted to do our observations. At the very last minute, Phil Massey, who was on the run with me, said, you know, I have a few stars that are very cold, they're very unusual, maybe they're weird because they're Thorngitgov objects, toss them on the list, why not? And we were adding them to our target list pretty much as the sun was going down. We then got to watch every single star that the telescope pointed to. We could control exactly where the telescope was pointing and look at the data as it was coming in. And people picture astronomical data, and I think they picture, you know, looking through the telescope and seeing something like this. If you've ever shown people some of the images you take with your own backyard telescope, or if you look at Hubble images, there's sometimes a disconnect going, oh, isn't it supposed to look like, you know, the pictures of Hubble we see on TV? The data that we were taking were spectroscopy. So we were sorting the light out according to its color and looking for little bright or dim spots from atoms that were absorbing or emitting light. Our data looked like this. It looked like basically lines in the data. And what caught our attention here were these little blobs of bright points along those lines. And they had caught the attention of one of our colleagues, Nydia Morell. She was such an expert at working with this data that she could read it basically at a glance. And she immediately realized those were strange sources of glowing atoms in these stars' atmospheres, which you don't normally expect. Normally the atoms in a star's atmosphere absorb light, they don't emit light. So she took one look at this and said, I don't know what that is, but I know that I like it. We earmarked this raw data, put it aside and kept on observing. Much later on, when I went back to analyze the data, I realized this star looked the way it did because it had luminous hydrogen in its atmosphere, which turned out to be a potential signature of a Thorngitgov object. When I looked at it in more detail, it turned out it also had the telltale changes in chemistry that we would expect from a Thorngit Cobb object. And it turned out this was one of the stars that Phil had added to our list at the very last minute as the sun was going down, as our observations were starting. So we had found what we think so far is the best candidate for a Thorngit Gov object, for this totally new way that a star can work. And it happened because we were sitting at the telescope, tinkering with that list at the last minute. We were able to earmark this one star to add to our list at the 11th hour. Sitting there watching the data come in, this particular raw data jumped out at Nydia right away, way before we wound up doing our final analyses. It was the sort of discovery that you could only make doing astronomy in that way. So sometimes when I tell my colleagues this story, I get some pushback. They say, well, does that mean that you never want to see automation happen at telescopes? Does that mean that Rubin Observatory is never going to find anything as exciting as a Thorngitgov object? I think the exact opposite is true. I think the automation and the computational power that we're putting into telescopes is incredible. I think Rubin Observatory could potentially find things like Thorngitgov objects if we learn more about exactly how they brighten and dim and how they vary but it can't do it alone. We don't only want telescopes like Rubin Observatory. We want the full variety of different telescopes that are available to us. We want these amazing survey telescopes that can detect heaps and heaps of new variable stars. We want observatories like Magellan where astronomers go and sit there and tinker with the telescope throughout the course of the night and get to point at that one weird thing that catches their attention because that's sometimes how you make amazing discoveries. We want telescopes that can observe across all wavelengths even if they wind up detecting microwaves or squirrels, working at radio wavelengths, working at X-ray wavelengths, working across the entire spectrum, looking at gravitational waves. This is the way to look at as much of the universe as we possibly can. And we want telescopes of all sizes. Amateur astronomers do amazing research that is only going to supplement and enhance what Rubin Observatory is doing in the Southern Hemisphere. These smaller telescopes that were built in decades past are perfect for looking at really luminous stars that big telescopes might be overkill for. So what we really need is this full breadth of tools at our disposal and the full list of different ways of doing astronomy. So this whole idea of how we do astronomy, the different tools we use, how these tools are changing our research and everything else is what I wind up covering in The Last Stargazers. So on that note, I will wrap up. I'll leave the book information up for just a moment and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. <laughs> Let me, uh, that was some amazing feedback. 
Let me sign off and sign back on. I will also go ahead and stop sharing just so that I can see everyone. Here we go. Hi. <laughs> Okay, I don't know if that's any better or not. George, you're on mute. I'm on mute. Well, now I'm not. Um, what is the chemistry of these foreign Zitco objects that you are looking for? So There's we were looking for a few. Go ahead. Uh, no, go ahead. So we were looking for a few specific elements that you don't normally see in a in great abundance in a red supergiant atmosphere. Um, so a unique aspect of these stars is that um, their inner layers are very convective. So you basically get big boiling convection cells going from the atmosphere straight down to the core. And the convective speeds are extremely fast. Um, they actually wind up supersonic in some cases for the sound speed inside the star. So you'll drag material down to near the neutron star. It gets bombarded with protons. It then gets dragged out into the outer layers and it starts to undergo beta decay. And before it can decay to a stable state, it gets dragged back down and bombarded with protons again and it repeats. It's this very weird process called the interrupted rapid proton process. And it leads to a huge buildup of very random elements. So rubidium is one example. Molybdenum is another. Um, not through that proton bombardment, but through that same sort of churn inside the star, you'll get a huge buildup of lithium. Um, you expect to see some excess calcium in the stars left over from when the original core of the star was disrupted. So we were looking for a suite of those elements. We were thinking, you know, if we see rubidium and molybdenum and lithium and calcium all enhanced, it's probably a good sign that what's going on in the star can only be explained by a thorn Jitkov object. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I've signed on and off like three times now. Last five that sounds minutes. perfect. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry about that. I want to go through the through the chat box too and make sure we give folks a chance. And uh, we're a little over time, but Emily, if you're willing, that'd be super. We can uh, hold Absolutely, you for a little yeah. longer. Um, so I know Jeff, you had a question. Uh, Jeff Kretsch, kind of early on. I think I lost maybe the yeah. chat box, but I wrote down a few a few names so jeff if you're on still you can ask your question yeah yeah i, just, I was just wondering are you still collecting stories for a follow um it's it's funny so i'm not i'm not officially collecting stories but i people still keep telling them to me and i love getting them um the little flying squirrels is actually a story that i learned after the book came out um the paperback edition is due out in january and unfortunately you can only make pretty little changes to a book when the edition when you go from hardcover to paperback but boy i'd love to squeeze that in if i could oh, yeah. and i love hearing people's stories whenever they have them to share uh, yeah, i don't know if you have an email to send it to or somewhere um, i am um, astronomer emily at gmail.com i'll put it in the chat so that people yeah can that'd be it. a better idea in my memory yeah cool thanks Jeff. There we go. Um, all right kajli agarwal um, you want to ask your question? Yes, I do. Uh, let me just turn on a little bit. So um, my question is more generic. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay. So uh, what is the scope for the people if they don't have degree in astronomy? Is there a way they can collaborate with professional astronomers and help them in at least data analysis or imaginary analysis? Like, is it something people do usually? Oh, definitely. Um, so there's, I know there are more resources for resources for this than I have a you know detailed knowledge of. But two things off the top of my head are one, um, things like the Zooniverse project, um, so Galaxy Zoo or sort of crowdsourced astronomy, where you can help with things like classifying um, different types of galaxies, um, working on analyzing some of the heaps of data coming out of big survey telescopes. Um, I'm actually working with the student right now on translating light curves, so the brightness variations that we get from stars, into audio files. So you can listen to 
a star, a, a pitch, say, go up as a star gets brighter and then a pitch drop as a star gets dimmer. And our goal is to involve folks who are visually impaired in citizen science because they can listen to different types of variable stars. Um, and another resource along those same lines is the AAVSO. So this is a partnership between professional astronomers and amateur astronomers, the American Association of Variable Star Observers. Um, I have research students using data from AAVSO. I'm sure there are folks here who have contributed data to AAVSO, and it's an awesome tool for amateur astronomers in particular to build up this great archive of bright object variability that we really need in a lot of the research that we do. So yeah, there's definitely ways to do that. Uh, it's just one um, related question. What skill set? Is there softwares or programming language? Like what usually astronomers look for a person who is not from astronomy background? It can really vary. It can be everything from you don't have a science background at all, but you just want to help out on um, the Zooniverse stuff to you have a lot of amateur astronomy experience with observing or you have programming experience. Um, I know that the most popular programming language now in astronomy is Python. Um, I mean, we have collaborators, or I have students that do data science and machine learning type coding that is not dissimilar to a lot of the work that's currently being done in industry. They're just doing it on different data sets. So it's a pretty broad skill set. I think if you're interested and you think you've got a skill set to offer, somebody would probably be super excited to hear about it. Okay, hi. Thank you. That was helpful. Thanks. Thanks, yeah. Kajli. Hey, I want to, before we uh, run out of too much time here, give give away one more book if we can, uh, Emily. So I'm going to resort to my my uh, Google here and see if we can generate a number. And okay, hold on one second. Um, I think, John, why don't you ask your question while I'm counting? John, uh, is it Bussy or? You see? Yeah, busy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, go for it. So, it, it, in your presentation, your third question there, like how has astronomy changed over time? And it made mm -hmm. me reflect a little bit. Like for you, you know, you should pictures when you were six. Uh, you know, and and but it made me reflect. Like, how has astronomy changed you, or changed these other astronomers over the time? You know, like is there a you know, a, a five-year astronomer, you know, somebody five years in the field is going to be probably different than somebody with 30 years in the field, you know, so do you, do you feel that you're changing or that the, the astronomers you visited with have changed because of their, you know, weird hours or staring at the stars or thinking about the cosmos <laughs> or insignificance or whatever? You know, you know, what's actually funny is I, it's a great question. I think part of us haven't like there, there's an interesting sameness to the people who get to do this for their job and do it permanently. Like the six year old face from that first okay. slide is still in yeah. there. Like yeah. you, you never forget that what you're doing is cool. Everybody winds up having like you sometimes lose, you know, my God, I'm looking at data from billions of light years away. And instead you're sitting at your oh, laptop yeah. going, why is the freaking code not working? Like it can, <laughs> you, it's not always beautiful. But yeah. that enthusiasm is really still there. And I was amazed at people that I interviewed. Um, one colleague that I feature in the book is a colleague of mine, George Wallerstein, who's in his early 90s. Um, and he was telling me he'd observed for like 30 years with photographic plates and then 30 years with digital imaging. And he's watched the politics of the field and the funding of the field okay. and the resources in the field change. But he just he still just wants to talk about science. And he sounds when he talks about the research that he's doing, like I did on my first project as a grad student and like anybody who's interested in their science. So there's a nice sameness to the enthusiasm. Um, I think people get a really interesting perspective on sort of Earth as a planet. I think you get very used to feeling small and it's very easy to think of us as planet scale and like human scale. Um, and I think that goes both ways. I think it means that a lot of the things that we try to throw up as dividing lines or throw up as, you know, sources of conflict on Earth kind of seem tiny to us. And it's it's really, it's, I know for a lot of my colleagues, it's really inspired, I don't want to say activism, but a attitude of, hey, why are we stopping people from studying astronomy? Why don't we have more women in science? Why don't we have more people of color in science? This is a field that needs as many humans as we can. Why yeah. are we throwing up barriers to this? And 
I know it also gives people a careful attitude about, you know, this is the one planet we've got. This is the one human community we've got. Let's, let's be good to, to it. One, right? <laughs> yep. There is no planet B is the quote that you hear over and over again from, yeah. from my colleagues who study exoplanets and study the potential planet Bs. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Emily, for sharing your thoughts. You've really brought a human, fun, exciting side to, to astronomy. Yeah, so thank you. Oh, good. Yeah, thank you. Very great. Okay, the winner of the next book is uh, Danielle Christensen. Um, hopefully, Danielle is still with us here. Should be. Yeah, I'm here. Thank you so much. Okay, sweet. Uh, just let us know how we can get it to you. Send Send me an email or um if we can look you up in the membership database that's great too but uh be sure to reach out to us to to get the right address for you okay thank you so much yeah cool all right um chris let's talk let's ask your question about uh starlink <laughs> well it's not really new, but the question was about starlink but as emily when you were talking about the the vero rubin telescope you know, you talked about people you know catching meteors in the in the the the, the, the plates and so on and so forth. And all I could think of was holy smokes. But you know, um, my real question though was going back to uh, one of your your slides where you showed a balloon launched telescope. Yes. How on earth? Well, how? how does that work because you know you put something up on a balloon you don't have a whole lot of pointing accuracy you know with right. the with the thing by itself so are those survey instruments that are just sucking in electrons and photons or are you know are they able to point can you tell us a little more about that so, so sometimes they are survey instruments. Sometimes they basically go up and they act like, you know, radiation detectors and just count what they're able to detect. But sometimes they are pointable. Um, a lot of people ask me this about Sophia too, because you imagine your commercial flight where there's turbulence and then you think of trying to point a telescope. Um, usually they will just be mounted on a gimbal or ball bearing or float system such that they are turnable to a certain degree. Um, the Sophia telescope is mounted on, fun fact for parties, the world's largest ball bearing <laughs> and it floats on it. Um, it's actually really wild to see while you're on the plane because you feel the plane juggling and the back end of the telescope, which you can see from the crew area of the um, aircraft is just staying so eerily still. Um, for balloons, it's something similar where there will be a team on the ground during the balloon's flight. Once it's what they call at float, so at the altitude where it wants to stay, they can control it and take pictures and turn it or do whatever, would it, do whatever the instrument needs to do, assuming all is going according to plan. Um, I have a couple of colleagues at the University of Washington actually who were balloon scientists and told me these amazing sets of stories of how balloon launching should work, where you slowly inflate this balloon and you watch it get strong enough and strong enough to actually rise up. And then up behind it, you send, you know, explosive collars for ending the flight and the payload and everything else and everything whisks peacefully away. And then stories of when that hasn't happened and when a instrument has basically gotten bowled across the ground like a two-ton bowling ball or when they there's a very ominous thing called free fall accidents when something will drop from a balloon and not have a parachute open or similar. Um, but it's, it's learning about balloon astronomy was one of my favorite bits of research for the book because it was an area I had not worked in at all. And learning about how they control them and how they deal with, you know, it's just sort of floating. How do you point the payload off the bottom is really interesting. Huh. Well, thank you very much again for this, Emily. I mean, your, your enthusiasm is absolutely infectious. I just, <laughs> I love it. Okay. Thank you. Hey, I had one for you, Emily. Um, uh, based on all the things you've told us, and I know your book goes into more detail, what place haven't you visited or haven't, haven't you been to that you would like to go as a professional? <sighs> This is painful because somebody also asked about this in the chat. I was planning out all the trips for different places I wanted to go and I had interviewed people and I'd heard stories about some amazing observatories that I thought I had to get to. And one of the only places that I had to jettison just because it didn't work with my schedule is I thought, you know what, just for now, I'm not going to go to Arecibo. I'm sure I'll get to go later. <laughs> and that was it was absolutely heartbreaking to watch what happened to Arecibo this past December. Um, I, I'm sure 
people have seen the video, there's re really an incredible footage of what ultimately happened to cause the collapse, the um, support cables that snapped, and the instrument platform going crashing down to the dish. Um, I had colleagues that started asking people, you know, I know it's a fascinating video, but please stop sharing it on social media. It's like watching, it's like watching a death. It's like, it, it was heartbreaking. Like I had colleagues who lived there for years, who entire career had started at the observatory. And I'm so, so sad that I don't get to go. I don't know what plans are for rebuilding. I really hope they do. It was one of the most amazing scientific instruments on the planet. It's such an amazing place for research. Um, I've talked to students from Puerto Rico whose entire interest in science and entire career got launched by having a Recibo up the road. So I really hope they are able to rebuild it in some form, but boy, I wish I'd gotten the chance to go. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I thought you might say the South Pole Telescope. Have you ever? <laughs> oh, <laughs> Have you ever that's on the list. That was on my wish list to go to, too. Um, I had originally proposed a longer timeline for writing the book, and had I had the time, I was going to apply to, there's a National Science Foundation program yeah. that sends authors to the South Pole. Um, I, I, the Antarctica is, is the place on my bucket list <laughs> for yeah. somewhere to go, but I still like to think that eventually I can get there. So it doesn't feel like the lost chance in a way that going to Sierra Sebo does. <laughs> Yeah, it's still there. Hey, uh, Dan, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, hi, Emily. Great presentation. Hi. Thank you. I have many questions, but yeah, one. So I work with geographic information systems, and I'm wondering if they're used in astronomy in any way to map stars and universes, and if they do it, do they do it in 3D, or do they use some other applications for that? So I'll confess, I don't, I don't work in that area at all. Um, and we will, <laughs> um, I mean, most of the tools that we use for mapping is we'll basically, we'll basically take sky surveys and then map sort of our, the coordinate systems we always use or our rain deck, sort of use that to wind up mapping the sky. We don't dent and map relative to, we don't map relative to the geography of the earth. We map relative to the celestial sphere. Um, so that's not something that we generally use. Um, there's a cool exception where we'll use radar to map planets. This is something that Arecibo could do, um, that we would actually, you know, bounce radar off of Mercury and figure out that there was ice or map the surface of Venus to some extent using radar. So there's there's other mapping tools that you can use at, and planetary science at fairly local scales. But for actually mapping the night sky, we basically just do big surveys at different wavelengths to different depths and match up or wind up identifying whatever sources we have that we want to go back to. Thank you. Yeah, cool. Um, Bill, uh, I know we're running late, but uh, a couple more maybe. Bill uh, Burton. Uh, thank you very much, Emily. Great talk. My question concerns the, the well-known lack of diversity historically in astronomy, the need to grow the ranks in that regard. And yet there's a limited number of world-class observatories, which I'm a geologist, there are rocks everywhere to study, but you know, see the, the observatory thing seems like a bottleneck. So in the future, you wanna grow the field, but how do you reconcile that with, with you know, the limited opportunities for research, you know, just practically? Um, this is actually one of the ways in which uh, observatory like Rubin Observatory can be really amazing. Um, I've talked to people that talk about the democratizing effect it'll have on astronomy, that it is going to generate, boy, what's the number? Petabytes of data per month, like just untold amounts of data that are going to be in a public archive eventually that anyone can use. So if you are teaching at a school that doesn't have preferential access, to a telescope. Um, University of Washington has access to Apache Point Observatory. A lot of the California observatories have access to, or California schools have access to their observatories or observatories in Hawaii. If you teach at a community college, if you teach at a historically black college or observatory that doesn't traditionally have telescope access, you can still get all the Rubin Observatory data and work with it and do research with it and involve students in it. Um, it's also accessible just from an, a literal access standpoint. It's very physically strenuous to travel to a telescope and observe there all night. 
Um, if you are an astronomer who is disabled, it can be very hard to do some of this research and having public data available is really great. Um, I still would love to see us build a lot more telescopes. Um, it's a bottleneck to just the amount of science that we can do. And we have no shortage of people ready to do this science. Um, I work in um, graduate admissions at the University of Washington in our department. And we have hundreds and hundreds of students applying every year now. We break our we break our applicant record every year. And these are many of them are brilliant, very accomplished students who would be amazing scientists. And if we have the money to support them and the money to build telescopes for them, we could do so much. So I'd love to see that change. Thank you for your answer and for your talk. Thanks. Anybody else? Uh... Like I said, I kind of lost the chat room, but I think I got through most of them. If if anybody uh, has anything, uh... I'll um I'll thank Alan for his couple comments about the McDonald Observatory story. <laughs> um, there's a there's a quite infamous um, astronomer named Gerard de Vacalors, Um and if you read it if you read it all about the debate about the Hubble constant and how we sort of describe the expansion of the universe. He's a starring player in that, and he is a character. Um, and when people told me the telescope being shot story, um, he was at Texas at the time, and more than one person said, you know, somebody brought a gun into a telescope. It wasn't because of Devacalores. They felt they had to tell me that, contrary to what I might think, he wasn't the reason. And he was a, he was a character and, was involved, I think, in the aftermath of that with the psychiatric exam. I think that's the comment that you would put. Um, and I didn't get the chance to feature as many of these sort of historical personalities in my book, but there's some other great books that do explore some of these folks and their contributions to the field. Yeah, Emily, I was I was sort of expecting you might talk a little bit about personalities of astronomers, because especially yeah. in the old days when they did the observing at the telescope, there's a certain kind of personality that likes to mm -hmm. stay up all night at 10,000 feet and not deal with other people. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the case of Gerard, um, he was quite a character, but his wife yeah. was the sane one. And I think a lot of these astronomers <laughs> tend to, to marry other astronomers, which is something yes, else. Yes, this, this is very, very true. Like yeah. the box and, and people like that, because Mm -hmm. Only only two astronomers could deal with each other. Well, and but, I write I write about some of the first women to work professionally at observatories and some of the first women to be PIs. And I'm I'm sure that among some of them were you know I get a whole telescope and just a dome to myself all night. Perfect. <laughs> like that's that was definitely a shared sentiment sometimes. <laughs> But yeah, there, I get a little bit into the sort of quirks and personalities of astronomers in the book, but I very much like sharing the stories of not necessarily the famous people, just the, you know, this is a person who works in the field and had a wacky experience or had a familiar experience because I found that a lot of these stories are familiar to readers. Um, they may not have worked all night at a telescope, but they've worked a night shift. They may not have crashed their car going up to an observatory, which a lot of us have done, but they understand driving on perilous mountain roads, or they understand being tired and trying to make judgment calls. And it was nice to sort of draw in the wild personalities for sure, but also the familiar people that a reader would recognize, even if they're not a scientist. There's also a recurrent theme of people trying to do technical work above 10,000 feet and doing really stupid things because mm -hmm. of oxygen deprivation. I had, I, I've observed up at the summit of Mauna Kea, which is very low oxygen and had colleagues tell me about taking notes while observing and coming down and going, this is gibberish. Gibberish. I can't read I can't what I wrote. That. And uh, we, we used to pull. Hmm? You were on the Subaru, right? So I was on the Subaru, way up telescope. Uh, I, I visited the Subaru telescope quickly. Well, I didn't have much time to do any uh, ac yep. acc accommodation of a, of a lack of air. And, uh, you know, we were walking around. There were spots, black spots in front of my eyes. I, mean, I would hate it to work up there. You know, did you, how did you accommodate I, that? Uh, so when you observe at Mauna Kea, they have you sleep for a night at 9,000 feet before you go yeah. up to work at 14,000 feet. So yeah. you do acclimatize. I'm lucky in that I've never, I've, 
gone to high altitude for fun before and I don't seem to have much trouble with it. Um, right. I did have an observing colleague get taken down though because she was having too much trouble with the oxygen. Yeah. And even when you're feeling good, the judgment drop is very clear. Um, there was a little oxygen saturation meter up there that you could hook onto your finger and we would play with it and see how low our oxygen number was getting. And the fact that we found this entertaining was like the first bad sign. Yeah. Um, and they would have little bottles of oxygen with a mask that you could give someone if they needed it in an emergency. Yeah. And the off-label use that people told us about was that your visual acuity drops when your oxygen level goes down. You just yes. Your eyesight just isn't as good. So ironically, you're at this beautiful stargazing site and you look up and you're kind of like, that's fine, because your eyes just aren't, get, your oxygen starved brain yeah. isn't seeing the same view. Yeah. So people would talk about going out with an oxygen tank going, well, that's not too good. <laughs> Yeah, and mm -hmm. seeing the stars bloom into view once they cut a little oxygen. So absolutely not the recommended use, but you can get away with it in the middle of the night. Yeah. <laughs> oh, hey, I want to go to John Croon. You had your hand up maybe. Uh, did you have a question or? or yes. Yeah, I appreciate that. I uh, I just wanted to ask two quick questions and say, uh, first of all, um, Emily, I, I loved your talk and your enthusiasm. Really enjoyed it. And uh, my two quick questions were, uh, are um, are you an astrophotographer for fun by any chance? And uh, question two is, what role has artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithms played in your experience in a modern professional astronomy? Um, so the first question is a quick answer. I'm sadly not an astrophotographer. Um, of the different interests and hobbies that I've gotten into, photography hasn't been one of them. Um, both my husband and my dad are into photography, though not astrophotography necessarily. Um, but I, I am a spectroscopist, ironically, so I'm not even a professional <laughs> astrophotographer. I, I get most excited by little bumps and wiggly lines. Um, but it's, I love, I have colleagues who are astrophotographers and they take amazing photos while they're observing, usually if the telescope's broken and they have a little time to kill, they'll get some incredible photos from these summits. Um, so as for the question about AI, um, this is an excellent question because I have a student who's doing this work right now. Um, but machine learning and AI is becoming more and more valuable in astronomy as our data sets get bigger. Um, because we are now dealing with easily data, set, data sets that hold a billion um, things. We'll look at a sample of a billion stars, we'll look at hundreds of millions of galaxies or similar. and trying to understand or interpret what we're working at requires a certain facility with big data. And then trying to use, I mean, classification algorithms and their ilk are very useful on their own. Um, and being able to try and pull some physics out of them based on their decisions is really amazing. Um, I have a student who just published a paper on how to classify stars based on their brightness, their color, and their variability. And he can identify stars based on just how bright they are that actually, when you take a spectrum of them, have emission lines. So he's pulling out spectral data based on brightness behavior. And he did this with a support vector machine. He was able to do coarse classification pretty well. Fine-grained classification wasn't as good. He tried a couple other machine learning tools that wound up not being as successful. But I mean, it's absolutely the type of computer science that I've, I similarly have friends who work in um, the machine learning field or AI or like explaining AI and tech. And they, there's a lot of overlap between what they do in industry and what we do in astronomy. And I think, I think we can learn a lot from some of the cutting edge research that industry is doing, but we can then pull physics out of it for the stars that we study, which is really cool. Okay, I think we got through all of them. Last last call. Um, where's the uh, where's the first extraterrestrial signal going to be detected? Um, <laughs> microwaves. Our, I mean, <laughs> um, <laughs> get off the stage. Oh. Question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. But Alex, I don't so know. Much. Yeah. Yeah. Thank mm -hmm. you so much for your time tonight. It was terrific having you and. Uh, uh, the book is great. I recommend everyone uh, pick it up and take a read on it. Um, it's it's really uh, really hits home for for a lot of us, I'm sure as it did with me. So um, thank you, thank you so much, and 
we'll keep in touch with your career and uh, and where you, where you head next. So, thanks thank so much for inviting me. All right. Bye. Bye.